James chapter 1 in our Bibles again this morning. James, the half-brother of our Lord, the pastor in the church in Jerusalem for many years, also an author of this book that we admire and that has been of such help to us in strengthening this matter of our faith, our dependence, our trust in God. In fact, the theme of the book of James is how faith works. And already we've discovered in our study how faith works in this matter of temptation. Verses 2 and 3 and 4, which say, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Uh, he goes on to say, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let Patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, wanting nothing. Then the Bible says, but uh, talks about our prayer lives. But let him ask, he says in verse number five, rather, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. So here the subject then turns from how faith works in temptation to how faith works in our prayer lives. And we all, each of us, we discovered last week, ought to pray routinely we ought to pray regularly that God would give us wisdom because uh, that's what he's commanded us to do and that's what we need now tonight or this morning rather we come to verses 9 10 and 11 and the subject at hand is how faith works in humility how faith works in humility let me read the text text for you and I want you to notice a contrast that is presented unto us. It is a comparative uh, passage of Scripture, these verses, and it's a comparison of believers and their situation in life. The first person we meet in this contrast is called the brother of low degree. The Bible says of this brother or to this brother, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted but the rich in that he is made low because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away for the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways oh apart Apart from faith in Christ, all of the wealth in all of the world is not sufficient to buy us one moment in eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. And apart from faith in Christ, the rich man will fade away, the Bible says, in all his ways. And last week, Mrs. Kingsbury and I had the privilege of celebrating our 43rd wedding anniversary. And a great, great adventure it has been. Now, the last 10 years on the final week in the month of July is always the time for the Sword of the Lord Conference in, in, uh, in uh, uh, North Carolina. But this year, I took Mrs. Kingsbury along with me. And boy, it sure makes travel a lot funner when I have my bride with me. And uh, on our anniversary, we took the day, and I, uh, we uh, drove two hours uh, from Winston-Salem uh, to uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Why? We, we wanted to visit uh, a home, a mansion, uh, built by and under the direction of a man whose name is George Washington Vanderbilt II. And this house, called the Biltmore House, has the distinction of being the largest privately owned home in all of the United States. Uh, just this floor, uh, square footage of the floor uh, in this uh, massive uh, European style uh, home uh, is more than four acres. It's a massive place. It has a bowling alley indoor, as an indoor swimming pool. Now, you're talking about something built in the 1890s. And George uh, Washington Vanderbilt II was born in 1862. And he uh, 
he, he inherited money. His grandfather uh, was incredibly wealthy, the family. So he, when he was born, he had a lot of wealth. And he began traveling with his mother when he was a teenager. And on a particular travel from uh, New York where they lived, they went down to North Carolina and he really enjoyed the climate. And he saw a mountain there called Mount Pisgah. And he said uh, to his mother, he said, I'd like to buy this. And I'd like to build a mansion here. And so they bought about 91,000 acres of land. And last week we visited this house, still owned by the Vanderbilt family, several generations later. And I'll have to tell you, this 250-room home is incredible. It had 35 bedrooms, 43 bathrooms, 65 fireplaces. It took 1,000 craftsmen over six years to construct it. From the drawings, from the original drawings, uh, Vanderbilt, what he, what he did, he, because he had whatever amount of money he needed or wanted, he traveled to Europe and he found the design of a chateau that he liked and then expanded it manifold and hired the architects, oversaw all of the drawing. When he was in his early 20s, this was his single passion. Um, all of the furnishings inside of the home, uh, he personally, in 60 trips over the ocean, on, on ocean liner, to Europe, he would, made, would make a trip, he would buy furnishings for this, this, uh, this home and bring them back. It's, it's, it's opulent inside uh, with artwork and tapestries and, and uh, furnishings that are just, every, each one with a, with a history to them. He, he oversaw all of this uh, personally. It, it was a, an amazing uh, venture that really consumed about 10 or more years of his young life. Now, when he finished the home, uh, we were told, in uh, 1995, uh, 1895, well, then he, he's, he got married, and, uh, and his wife, uh, he and his wife had a baby daughter, and they lived in the Biltmore Mansion, uh, one husband and wife and one daughter, and uh, 2,000 employees. Now, this, this was, but now here's, here's what intrigued me. Do you know how long, you know how long he, this had been his life. I mean, if he said, what, what do you know about George Washington built, uh, Vanderbilt II? You know what they'd say? Built more mansion. That's what he'd say. I mean, that was, it consumed his life. But you know, you know how long he and his wife and daughter lived there? 14 years. He had a, appendectomy and contracted infection and died. Now, we have no record. There is anything I researched, I could find nothing, nothing that had anything to do with Christianity, any interest in Christianity. I don't know if the man was a believer or not, but I couldn't find any evidence at all that he had any faith in Christ, that Christ Christianity, the Bible, was a part of his life at all. It certainly doesn't show up anywhere in this opulent mansion. Uh, nowhere. But you know, whether he was a believer or was an unbeliever, he would be to the extreme of what our passage is introducing us to. He's saying on one hand, you have someone that is rich. This, he says, calls him the rich man. Okay? May be a Christian, may not be a Christian. But that, in, that rich man who does not allow faith to work, faith in Christ to work in his life as a man of means, the Bible says that when he dies, he just fades away. And if we could bring George Washington Vanderbilt II back from whichever place he is, if he could join us in this auditorium this morning, he would say to you, ladies and gentlemen, I lived the life of a fool. I invested my time, my life, my energies, every asset and resources I had, resource I had to build a mansion near Asheville, North Carolina. I lived in it a few years and then I died. And that's the legacy that I left in this world behind. 
And my friend, what a testimony of a wasted life whenever we endeavor to live our lives apart from dependence upon, faith in, reliance upon Jesus Christ and this book, the Bible, God's Holy Word. Now, on the other hand, in our illustration here this morning, we meet this man who is called uh, the brother of low degree. Now, now degrees are the uh, someone of a low degree was an indication of someone who was a very humble means. As sometimes, and in the contrast that we have here, it does present itself as one who is extremely poverty stricken. But he's called a brother. In other words, he's a saved person. And by the way, it's a good observation for all of us to make, particularly within the context of the book of James and the trial of our faith and various temptations. Sometimes in the very center of the will of God, a person may experience circumstances that bring them to what the Bible here calls a position of low degree. In other words, God removes any kind of financial security from them And he actually, in his will, allows them to possess nothing. So anyone that tells you on late night television or whatever that they have a formula for prosperity in this life and that if you're right with God and you're serving God, then God will bless you with all of these uh, uh, riches and et cetera, my friend, uh, turn them off and turn away. Refuse to bid them Godspeed. They are teaching heresy They are teaching false doctrine. The honest and and biblical truth is this, that we meet here in the book of James believers, and they are not all of equal uh, financial capabilities. In fact, one of them on this side, he's called a brother of low degree. And the other side, he's called the rich man. They're both brothers. They're both saved. They're both a part of this message that he's giving to them. But they have something in common, a need in common. Both the brother of low degree and the rich man, they both have one essential ingredient in their life that they cannot have apart from faith in Jesus Christ and in his word. What is that single ingredient? It is, are you listening? It is humility. Now, there's a difference between these two men. The man of low degree, the person of low degree, is being forced into a position of humiliation. By the way, our Lord was of low degree. Jesus said it this way, Come on to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Lowliness or being of low degree is not simply a word describing the absence of finances in a person's life. It is not simply a word of poverty, although our Lord said, I have no place, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The Bible also declares in Philippians that He who was rich for our sakes became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Jesus voluntarily became a man of low degree, low esteem. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Growing up in the home of Joseph and Mary. But when we meet this man of low degree, then we meet someone who is both experiencing a humbling experience, but is also expressing humility in that experience. And that's where faith in God comes in. Uh, This same phrase, low degree, is also used in Luke 152, for example, describing someone who has very little or no social standing or influence among people. God says in this verse that he puts down the mighty men from their seats and exalts others of humble circumstances. The Bible in Romans 12, 16 instructs the believers in the church at Rome and all believers in the churches 2,000 years later 
that we ought to condescend to men of low estate, the Bible says. In other words, we are not to, as the book of Galatians says, we are to remember the poor. Even our Lord said, hath not the Lord chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? So then we have a contrast here, a contrast of someone that through various circumstances of life has been humiliated. It may be economics. They had a home, lost a home. They had a job, lost a job. They had to declare bankruptcy. But it may be that this person was disfigured. Oh, they may have had a beautiful countenance, a beautiful face, but somehow we're in, you know anybody like that? Physically disfigured? It may have been a, a testimony of one that was uh, darkened by a stain of sin. Somehow, in some way, God has brought circumstances into this person's life. He's called a brother of low degree. God has brought him into a situation of humiliation. God forced it upon him. Now, there's a difference between being humiliated and humbling oneself. Because when God brings humiliating circumstances into our lives, when he brings us to a lower degree, it is always for the purpose that we might put our faith in him and trust in him, depending upon him. But we don't always respond that way, do we? Sometimes we respond in pride and arrogance and anger and bitterness against God. Failing to recognize, as James is at Denver, to teach these believers that had been scattered abroad, by the way, and you can imagine how this would be very applicable for them. We've detailed it already, but you that are our guests this morning, these believers scattered abroad, Acts chapter number 8, probably because of the persecution there brought on by Saul and others. They were scattered abroad. They went everywhere preaching the word of God. But people immediately, they went from wealth to poverty. They went from friendships and places of position, of influence, and suddenly they're cast out of their home. They're cast out of their community. They're cast out of their very country. And now they find themselves brethren of low degree. Nobody knows their name. Nobody cares about their name. They're just a nobody. They don't have anything. It's all different. And sometimes in the Providence of God, he allows those things to happen in, in people's lives. People that, yes, he loves and he cares for. Why? So that when we're in a position, brought into a position of low degree, so that we'll turn and put our faith and our dependence and our trust in him, realizing that he alone, he alone is our sufficiency. Uh, last year, two years ago, uh, I was uh, privileged to go to Dachau, the very first concentration camp opened by Adolf Hitler just three months after he assumed power in 1933 in Germany. Dachau was a place of great humiliation for millions of people, as were the other concentration camps. They stripped these men and women, many of them Jewish, many of them people of prominence and influence and, and uh, in the sciences, in the arts, in music, they degraded them. They took away everything from them. They stripped them naked in shame and embarrassment. They suddenly were thrust into a position of becoming of low degree. How could God be honored and glorified? How could someone benefit from such circumstances by faith in Jesus Christ and his word? God says, let the brother of low degree rejoice. What? How unreasonable could God be expecting us to rejoice when we've been humiliated? But that's exactly what he says. You say, how can you rejoice? By faith in Christ. That's how we rejoice. Now, the circumstances of life have a way of bringing embarrassing, shameful feelings our way. 
I mentioned last week being in that's the sort of the Lord Conference Monday night. We just just get in. Church has already started. A man sees me, a preacher that I've known, and we tried to help his son-in-law. Came into our school of discipleship. We tried to help him. That man came across the auditorium, came to me. He said, can I talk to you for a moment, Brother Kingsbury? He said, would you please pray, pray with me, pray for my son-in-law. He's, uh, he's in a coma and on life support in a hospital, overdosed on drugs. Pray for my daughter. Pray for the family, the children. He said, the heartache. All this. Now, you know what? You know what that man's going through? That man is being brought to a position of low degree. Don't you think that that dad is embarrassed and ashamed? And you know, he wasn't the first one just that night. We didn't leave church that night until two other people had come and talked with us. Standing at my booth, the next day a man comes up and uh, shakes my hand. He says, do you recognize who I am? No, he didn't say that. I said, you know, I know. I think I know you. The voice sounds very familiar. And I said, uh, are you? And then I called the man's name. And he said, I am. You know, I hugged that man. I said, brother, I heard that you got right with the Lord are serving Christ with your life. You know, the rest of that week, didn't he die? And he, he came by again and again. You know, his pastor came by and said, I just want to tell you what that meant to this man. You see, when God humiliates us, when God brings circumstances in our life, we've got to choose. We're going to live by faith in him. We're just going to rejoice. We're going to say, all right, God, you brought me here. Maybe I brought it on myself. I probably did some, but maybe some of it didn't come on because of my own. But you providentially have allowed me to be here. You've allowed my family to be here. And we're, we're not going to become angry and upset. We're not going to become bitter at you. No. James says, here's what you do. You rejoice. You say, but why? Why would anybody rejoice? Rejoice because, notice what he says in verse number 9. Rejoice in that he is exalted. Now, once again, this sounds insane. Is it not to you? No. You, you look, ask your family, are, are we exalted right now? No, we're so embarrassed we don't even want to go to church. But God said, you can choose to believe what your mind tells you or what society tells you, or you can choose to believe what God tells you. He says, I have allowed you to be humbled, humiliated so that you could be humbled. But you're going to have to accept this situation by faith that I will exalt you through this. Now, if you stop and think about it, when God allows poverty to someone's life, the Bible very clearly teaches us that when we are humbled by circumstances, that that ele does elevate us. That's what the word exalted means. It elevates our prayer lives. The Bible says God hears the cry of the humble. You mean he doesn't listen to me if I'm proud? That's exactly what I mean. So here's a person, they're humbled, they're humiliated. If we humble ourselves to God, we can rejoice and say, dear God, you, you have humiliated me so that I can be humbled so that when I pray, you'll, you'll listen intently to my burdens and to my cries. That's what God says. Now, there are several others, but for time's sake, let me just show you the one within the context. Look at James chapter number four. Over a couple of pages in your Bible, James chapter number four, this subject is going to come up again. And he says in verse number six of James four, these words, but he, that's God, giveth more grace. Grace is to the spiritual life what fuel is to your automobile. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. And for time's sake, go to verse number 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. When the Bible says that let the 
brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. He's reminding us that in humiliation, in humility, we find the grace of God. And the grace of God then gives us the desire and the power to fulfill the will of God. But it's not just for those that are of low degree. The next verse, same sentence, but the rich. And the idea behind it is, the rich, you need to respond in the same way. All right, so you've got a good testimony, a good reputation, and maybe you're at the other end of the social and economic scale, and thank God for that. But remember that you are made low. What do you mean? He says, well, let me explain it to you this way, from nature. Look at verse number 10. Because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun, verse 11 says, is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. So then here's the idea. Our lives, even as believers, are like plants. We're like flowers. The beauty of the flower is not because of the flower. The beauty of the flower is because of the creator of the flower. The life that is given to the flower is not of itself. Were there no sun? Were there no photosynthesis? Were there no laws that God had created and placed in the nature? The flower would never grow from a seed. It would never blossom. It would never bloom. All of its existence and its beauty rest upon the one who created it. God is simply saying to us, if you're in a position of prosperity today in any dimension or direction of your life, don't look around, don't look up, and don't think in your mind, well, you know what? I'm here because of, I'm a pretty sharp person. I must be better than... No, no, no. You're no better than. God is the reason for any and every success in your life and mine. Now, here's the contrast. A person of low degree has been brought providentially into circumstances that will make it conducive for them to humble themselves. He, it's forced upon them. The person that is not in that position must assume the position of humility voluntarily. But he does it the same way as the person of low esteem. He does so by faith in Jesus Christ. You see, how we look at our lives is absolutely transformed when we decide to live by faith in God and in his word. When uh, 1999, uh, I had the privilege of being in Cairo, Egypt. And we went on one, uh, one of the days there to the Egyptian National Museum in Cairo. And uh, I immediately... It's a massive place, but we only had a brief amount of time there. I immediately wanted to go to the, uh, see the, the uh, display from King Tut's tomb. Now, Tutankhamun was an Egyptian pharaoh of the 18th century. His tomb lay forgotten for thousands of years until its discovery in 1922. He was buried in an area south of Cairo called the Valley of the Kings. They, when they excavated, they found that he had been buried with opulence so that was just beyond comparison to any other king, just 19 years of age when he passed. Uh, it, the, we saw gold utensils. There was cooking uh, utensils there. Uh, there were uh, things for war made out of gold, uh, a bow and arrows and, and uh, spears, uh, swords. Uh, they even had a chariot of gold a full-size chariot of gold and a horse. And they buried him with all of these things. You see, their faith was that, that these things would be beneficial to King Tut in his afterlife. And so they, they 
poured all of this in, put all of this in. But you know what they discovered in 1922? That nobody had ever drawn that sword. Nobody had ever shot an arrow. Nobody had ever eaten out of any of those utensils, King Tut or anyone else. Why? Because their faith was misplaced, wasn't it? But you know, we looked at all of that and realized that just at 19 years of age, he, he died. They buried him with all this. How senseless. How wasteful. But you know, I didn't know it at the time, but I found out after I came back that one of my heroes uh, out of the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, was also buried in Cairo. Oh, long lines, long lines weren't, uh, weren't at his tombstone. In fact, it's very difficult, I'm told, to even find the tombstone of William Whiting Borden. Oh, Borden ought to, ought to trigger a memory in your mind if you're familiar at all with the dairy industry. You see, William Borden was born in 1879. Excuse me. It wasn't 1879. He was born in... Let me see it here. He died in 1913 at 25 years of age. Here's the story, though. When William Borden graduated from high school, he was 16 years of age, Chicago. Graduated from high school. His parents said, where do you want to do? They said, why don't you take a trip around the world? Now, Borden was a Christian. But you know, he grew up in a very, very wealthy family. He was, the, he was to come back from his trip, was going to go to Yale, and then was going to assume the chairman of the board of Borden Industries, the great dairy industry. He went on that trip, and as he saw the world, the Spirit of God kept saying to him, do these people know Christ? Do they know of Christ? He came back several months later and he said to his parents, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to sit as the chairman of the, I want to become a missionary to the Mohammedans in China. I believe that God, that's what God wants me to do. He went to Yale, then he went on to Princeton to theological seminary, and then he left for China, but uh, when his boat uh, came into Cairo, Egypt to stop for a brief visit. He uh, had contacted spinal meningitis, and he died. And his body's buried in an obscure grave in Cairo, Egypt. What a contrast between the King Tut. But um, I secured what it says on his, on his grave, and I think you'll find it to be a testimony of the difference that faith in Christ makes wherever you are in the social economic scale of life, the difference that faith in Christ makes. Here's Borden's tombstone. The sacred to the memory of William Whiting Borden, aged 25 years, born in Chicago, Illinois, entered into life eternal at Cairo, April 9, 1913, where after graduating at Yale University, it writes, it's etched also that he, and, and Princeton's Theological Seminary, he was preparing for pioneer missionary work among the Mohammedans in China. Underneath this is this verse. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 11. And then this statement. A man in Christ, he arose and forsook all and followed him, kindly affectioned with brotherly love, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, instant in prayer, communicating to the necessity of saints, and in honor, preferring others. And then in large, bold print are these words. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. And then these words. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. 
whether the brother of low degree or the rich man, or as would be true of each of us in this room today, somewhere in the middle, as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, wherever it is that God places you and me, it is not just important, it is imperative that we live by faith in Jesus Christ, that our lives may leave something behind of substance and significance of eternal value and not be wasted. God help us to live by faith in Christ in humility.